This float is how I go spearfishing over a mile offshore. And in this video, I'll run you through that process. Before I start one of these swims, the first thing to do is check the conditions. Today, it's sunshine reggae. The sea is pretty flat. There's not much swell. The wind is maybe 10 knots. So it's pretty good conditions. That is the first thing. And then also, if you're going to attempt a long swim, five kilometers, etc., make sure you are hydrated. And that doesn't just mean drinking a lot of water today. It means drinking a lot of water in the days leading up to today. Now, the viz looks good even in here. I know it's high tide, but that is still really nice for this close in. Another thing you want to check before you go do one of these swims is the tide. Now in the UK, just because it is high tide or low tide or thereabouts does not mean the current is going to slow down or stop. In fact, it can be quite the opposite. But let's talk about that a little bit more once we get onto our swim out there. As I've shown in previous videos, this is all the kit, but we'll talk about this in great detail after the dive. There's been very few occasions where I can actually see my feet in water this close to the shore, so I'm expecting big things out there. This is the float I used to swim on. Makes it much easier on these long swims than a torpedo float. Number one, you can always see where you're going instead of having your head down in the water with a torpedo float. Not so important when you're going up against headlands and stuff like that, but when you're out here, there's boats, there's all sorts of stuff. So. I like having my head above the water to be able to see what's coming at me. Secondly, it keeps your body out of the water, which makes it far easier to swim. Got about 500 meters left before I get to the first mark that I want to check out. But I thought I would take the time to talk to you about tides. Now, a lot of tides, it just takes a little bit of research and trial and error. And obviously you don't want to be doing a massive swim on places you don't know. But there are so many resources out there these days. The Navionics app, you can jump on that and look at certain parts of a tide. There's current indicators. So you can sort of figure out when the best time is to be diving. And that's also useful for remembering when you caught fish. Was it a low to high, a high to low? Was it still water? Was it absolutely running? All this sort of information you just have to figure out yourself. But what I will say is, pay attention to it. Given that I've just done 45 minutes of swimming, I need to take some fluid. You don't really realize how much fluid you lose when you're spearfishing, but let me show you, it's a lot. The first dive, I wasn't really prepared for coming down right on top of this rock. There were bass all over it, and all I could do was slowly sink to the bottom. Certainly a few nice fish, but I figured it was the first dive of the day and I should hold off to find a standout fish. Approaching slowly around this leaning rock, I saw a nice hole up ahead. Surely this would hold bass. After recently diving with Kevin Daly, I observed that he liked to stop for a little bit before approaching the holes to give the fish a chance to come to you. I figured I'd come back to this hole a little bit later on once the fish had settled down again. It was clear that today was one of those fishy days. Shoals of schoolie bass getting around nearly every dive and even small pollock as well. These two were definitely legal, but I was holding out for something more substantial. This dive was terrible. 
I knocked my spear gun as I was crawling along the bottom and was so surprised to see this bass still sitting with its head facing into a cave. It probably couldn't see me fumbling around. The first few dives have been really fishy. I've The first one I came down on that massive school of bass, but I just kind of wanted to watch them and there wasn't any really standout fish in the shoal. Just then, I was going along the bottom and I saw the silhouette and I think a rock was blocking this bass's vision. So I stuck up on it, put a nice shot through the head, secured it, but that's the first bass of the day. And hopefully you're going to hold out for bit of a bigger one because yeah now I've got this one off the back it's a bit easier to relax. <laughs> I decided to revisit the hole where I saw the decent bass come right up to my spear tip earlier in the day. A really nice fish is heading off and I try to close the gap while I can. Now that I've got my limit of bass, I have to turn my attention to other species. And that dive then, I just saw one black bream and I probably should have shot it straight away, but I wanted to see if there are any more bigger ones. And then right at the end of the dive, I saw some bigger ones, much bigger. So I'm gonna try and put in a longer dive here and see if I can get one of those black bream. With conditions so good, I couldn't help but have a quick dive with the camera before heading in. I've now got three nice fish, so I might head back in before this tide starts pumping. And on the beach, I'll explain to you all the details of what I put on that float. Let's have a chat about this float. 
So let's start with the thing I get the most questions about, and that is this drop anchor here. This is how I anchor the float. When I'm diving, the reason I use an anchor as opposed to a drop weight is because this thing is quite big. So all I have here is this Oma anchor and floppers come out here and I tend to set different amounts depending on what the bottom structure is like. So if it's very flat, I tend to put all of them out. If it's very rugged like today, I'll put maybe two tines out. It makes it a bit easier to retrieve. Here is the line winder. This is from One Shot. Really cool line winder, not too big. I find this very helpful when anchoring this float. Two spear guns here along the side. This is the 75 and that is a 90, which is what I was using predominantly today. They just tuck up under the handles and a bit of elastic holds them in place. Now, when I've come back in for a shore dive or when I'm walking out to a spot, this is what you'll probably see here. This red dry bag full of stuff. When I'm walking to a spot, I use this dry bag to hold my fins like so. And then inside that, I can pop my mask and snorkel and whatever else, water bottle, etc. while I'm on my way to the spot. Speaking of the water bottle, this is just a regular water bottle, but it has one of these cool silicon holders here for also from one shot. And I really rate these. They just slip over the end of any water bottle and then you can securely attach to the top so it doesn't float away, which is really good. I have my gloves in there. This is my really long flag. Really need a long flag out here with all the boat traffic, but it sits in the holder just there like that. It sits a meter above. This is a carbon fiber pole I've got off Amazon. This is my very basic GPS. It doesn't give you any charts. It just gives you a spot of where you are in North Up, which is all I really need when I'm out there. Safety wise, I also have a whistle here for attracting attention, which you need. And there's also a compass on it as well. Now under the dry bag here, I have these two straps. They're very basic. They're just adjustable webbing straps. And so when this sits down like this, I can put these over my shoulders and walk with it on my back. The reason I don't put it on the bottom of the float is because this float has a big ruddery type thing under it, big plastic keel. That's the word I'm looking for, keel. It has a keel under it. So you don't want that in your back. As for the actual model, this is a Sevlor Dive Hunter. Sadly, they are no longer in production. You can't get these anymore unless they're secondhand. But there are a few alternatives on the market, like the Bouchard Guardian or the Epsilon Patrol. Maybe they're mixed up, I'm not sure which one's which, but there's a big type float thing that you can find out on there. I don't think they're quite as good as this one because it doesn't have the ball of air at the front. This pocket which stops it nose diving, but you'll definitely be able to use it and get out for shore dives. So I hope that answers a few of the questions that you guys have been asking about my float setup over the past few videos. For now, back to the kitchen to cook up some of these fish. It's Friday, the sun is shining, so I'm just going to whip up a quick little lunch, and that is with my bass wings. What I've done is I've taken the fillets off, and after that, you are left with a lot of meat around this middle thoracic section of the fish, which is the wings, or what I like to call the wings, or some people call them the collars or the throats. Now, it's very easy to get these off the bass. All you have to do is take the fillets off, and then run your knife under this little joint, and then run your knife over the top of the ribs, and you'll be left with this beautiful piece of meat like this. Now, because it's Friday, I can't be bothered doing anything too extravagant. I'm going to do something quite naff, and that is use some pre-made Nando's marinade. Now, these fish wings are not too dissimilar to chicken wings, and this stuff is really great all over these wings and then straight onto the barbecue. Also, if you really want to trigger someone from the UK, start calling it Nando's, not Nando's, and you'll start seeing the twitches. It's good fun. I've taken the scales off this and just let this marinade sit for 30 minutes. I'm going to go skin side down. Slap a bit more of that excess Nando's sauce all over it. Lovely. I didn't really take my own advice from the last video and not move the fish once it's down. Lost a bit of the skin here. But I will pick that off and eat that for sure. Now that is what I'm talking about. These Nando style fish wings are so, so epically tasty. 
I really encourage you to try it if you've never tried the wings off a fish before. This is a really easy way to do it on a barbecue. You could do it in a fry pan if you wanted as well, but that Nando's marinade, delicious. Thank you so much for watching. If you've got this far, I hope that you enjoyed the video, you got something out of it, you learned something, and I hope it encourages you to maybe try shore diving some new places and know that it's not just boat diving that produces lovely fish. Fun fact, I actually haven't dived on a boat in the UK since 2021. So I've been doing only shore dives in this country and I've still managed to get a few fish. So cheers to that. See you on the next adventure, which will probably be in Spain.